Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be talking in general about complete dentures, a little bit on partials and some implants over dentures in this session. So let's have a look at Bert. So this is Bert here and I'm going to take his lower forefront teeth out and I'm quite a fast worker as you can see. So they were periodontally involved and they've got caries as well. I've fitted these uh, dentures so he's got a full lower immediate denture fitted and a full upper denture. I'm going to take the optra gate out and, and then I just tried to take the lower denture out and this is the suction I got on it. Brilliant. So that's after fitting it and there's no implants underneath that. That is purely peripheral seal. So I got Bert back one week later and I've got my Lacron carver on the lower denture and I'm really pushing it and I can really load this denture and push it really firmly with the Lacrom. It's, it's solid. You can see that Bert, if you actually look at the video carefully, he's really helping me with this. His tongue is actually just sitting on the back of that lower denture. Just, and I can push it. It's really like pushing against a solid object, like a brick. It was, it's really solid. And I want to show you how I did that in this lecture today and the secret really is to do with the shape of the lower denture the way it sits in the soft tissues and we can form a peripheral seal um, they also have terrific stability these types of dentures as well but if you actually look right at the top right at the top of that slide up there you can see a little bit of acrylic that sits right over the retromolar pad and completely covers the retromolar pad that's part of the secret to this. So these are Bert's complete dentures in place and this is what I truly love doing is trying to replicate nature and give these patients back what was missing. So I love putting fillings in, little cracks in, just characterizing the teeth. These teeth are Shotlander Enigma Life teeth. They're a British product and I helped to develop them over about five years and they are beautiful and you can get them in Australia as well. They're superb. But I love arranging them just like this. And, and this is really what I absolutely love doing is taking someone from this to this to putting them back where they were naturally. And the way that I do that is I ask the patient to bring in a photograph of themselves with their natural teeth when they were really much younger. So this is what Bert brought in for me. <laughs> so, which one's Bert here? Here he is. So that's the only one of him with, with his teeth showing. However, he's got his two brothers up here and we thought he looked a bit like this brother up here. So we actually used him, and his face shape was similar, we used him as a reference, and I always need a reference to work with in order, in order to copy where the teeth should go. So now, I used to really hate dentures, and I've just actually spoken with Angela, who just walked in, and she said the same thing to me. We, you know, I used to really hate doing them, and this is a common problem that my patients used to have. Blow it out. <laughs> <laughs> seriously so but it is really difficult and actually after six years of qualification I qualified in 93 so six years on sort of in like 98 99 I was really almost going to give up dentistry I was really sick of it unpredictability with prosthodontics in particular dentures and fixed pros really hated it and um this guy saved me. This is uh, Fraser McCord. He's a, he was a, a Scottish professor at Manchester University in the northwest of England. He had a great love of dentures. He was brilliant, great teacher. So this is what he said to me. I actually started an MSc program. This is what he said to me two weeks in to doing that program. In a really strong Scottish accent on the clinic 
in front of the other post grads. So, but it was true actually, it was a kick up the bum because I really didn't know what I was doing. So, uh, but actually he taught me so many things and these are the things I'm going to be covering in this lecture today for you. So seven aspects I think are really important in producing great looking and also great functioning dentures. So first of all, I think this is absolutely crucial. I know there's quite a few technicians in the room. It's brilliant that you're here because having a great technician is absolutely vital and they don't get the respect that they deserve. Rowan is my equal. It's a marriage. We've been working together for 20 years. He's terrific. And he works in the room right next door to my surgery. So I've got the clinic here. And then in a the door next to it, we've got the lab. And that's the heart of the practice. And Rowan and I have a constant dialogue about patients. We talk about them, we plan them. And we love doing this, just sitting down and working through it. We worked for 20 years together and we really have grown and learned from each other. So now the second thing is, in terms of getting really good at making dentures is, is this thing, it's called deliberate practice. And this chap here is Anders Ericsson, he's a Swedish psychologist based in America and he's like the world's leading expert in human performance and expertise. He's really looked at it and he wrote this, he's written this terrific book. I wished I'd read this 20 years ago, it would have accelerated my learning, but it's terrific. And what he says basically is, in a nutshell, is none of us are born brilliant at difficult things. None of us are born brilliant at making dentures. It doesn't come naturally. It's just like chess, a golfer, all of these other things, all these difficult things that we can do. So, and what he says is true experts have really good mental images of what they're trying to produce. So they have in their mind, the end product, or say for instance, an impression, the shape of an impression before we actually do it. So let's have a look at Bert's dentures here. These are Bert's. And I really want to have in my mind a good picture of where I'm heading. You know, so the end in mind with this, really good mental representation. So in a nutshell, if I was going to be, if it was, if I was going to have a conversation with me 20 years ago now, this is what I'd be saying to myself. Right, Finn, if you want to get good at making dentures, you need to do at least five a month, enough practice. Secondly, be open, and this is really a difficult one, be really open to feedback from various people, like the patient, been open to feedback from them, what their concerns are, been open to feedback from the technician. If the technician is not, you know, if Rowan's not happy with my impression, he says, Finn, do it again. And also another great thing is having really good mentors. And Mark touched on this, Lyndon Cooper is your mentor. You know, my mentor over the past 10 years has been this man here, John Bessford, who spoke at the ADC two years ago. And he is a, just a wonderful man. And I did his course 10 years ago, and he showed me this case here. This is a full, full set of dentures that he made for a patient. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, wow, this is what I want to do. This is what he calls prosthodontic privacy. You know, that no one would guess that they are full dentures at all. And that's, I went straight back to the practice, said to Rowan, this is what I want to be doing. So he has critiqued my work for years and we are in constant dialogue. It's wonderful having a mentorship. So, and also Finn, you, you've got to do the boring stuff. You've got to get to the library. You've got to look at the papers and read all the literature you can on this particular topic. Also do courses and watch an expert doing it. So you can actually then mirror that in your own practice. And then Finn, apply what you learn. When you're treating a patient, you are focusing on that particular individual. You're not actually thinking about other stuff, you know, about what are the kids having for tea and all your emails and all that sort of thing. Focus on that particular, be mindful of that. So 
Anyway, let's move on to the clinical stuff, the really exciting stuff. So a really important key in producing great looking dentures is having superb photos, dentate pictures. More and more patients have them now. We can photograph them, enlarge them, and we can look at them on a big screen, just like Muriel here, with that beautiful smile. And this is what she came in with, with this, which we like to call, it's the British Standard Denture with little teeth set on the ridge, looking awful. And, and then watch what happens when I actually put a denture in that replicates this. And nothing changes about a face, apart from that, just that, this photo, that, the teeth here. So it really just transforms the way someone looks. And I love it. So, and actually the way, that, what I'm trying to do is, really simply is, if a patient's class one, that's what I do. If they're class two, division two, division one, with a big overjet, I put the teeth back where they were naturally. If they're two, two, that's what I do. And if they're class three, that's what I do. I try and put them back where they were naturally. If those teeth, if I actually position the teeth where they were naturally, the dentures not only look really good, they are more stable because of that. So, and the way that I actually do this in terms of achieving this good aesthetic result is, I want to have a look at a photograph. So this is Julie here. That's her at the age of 12 on that picture. She's got a wax rim in her mouth here. So it's just a conventional wax rim. And I carve that with reference to the photograph. And I really want to try to get a mental picture of Julie if she had her natural teeth now. And that photograph really helps me with that. And the sequence that I'd use for carving the rim is very, very simply, it's a set recipe. Every single time is lip support first, incisal plane second, relative to the interpupillary line, or relative to the photo, if the patient wants to copy their natural dentition. Occlusal plane, parallel with the ala tragus. Buccal corridors, according to the photo, and center line, according to the photo. And if you notice, Claire here, Claire's worked with me for 12 years, and she's got a great eye for looking to see if the patient looks right once we've carved the rim. So, so once we've done that, and also got the vertical dimension looking right, I photograph the patient with the rim in place. And this is like dead important. This is so important for technicians, this, this particular point. So Rowan gets that. He gets this photograph. He has his iPad in the lab. He's got those two pictures. He's also got the wax rim. And then he sets the teeth up using that, this photograph here as a reference. And if I've not carved the rim enough, he can set the teeth up a little bit if need be. So let's have a look at Julie with her full denture in place. There, that's what we did for her. With some movement of the teeth. It's really important for Rowan to, Rowan's had to learn to be brave with his tooth positioning. You know, sort of think, going away from his training of setting teeth up straight, but really, really being brave with moving those teeth looks way better. So, right, impression making. So how did I get this, you know, these really well-fitting dentures? So let's have a look at Bert again. So let's get back to Bert. Classic combination syndrome. You'll love this. <laughs> Flabby ridge, really wobbly. You know, this has been occurring for years. So this, these lower teeth have just been going bash, bash on that ridge and resorbing all of the bone and leaving that flabby tissue. If I make a, an impression on that and squidge all that tissue up, when I come to fit my denture, it's not gonna fit because that flabby tissue is gonna want to push it out. So I want to make an impression to actually get around that particular issue. And this is how I do it. So once I've done my primary model, primary impression, we construct a special tray with a window on it here and that allows this really wobbly tissue just to hang through the window. I border mold that 
uh, special tray with green stick. So just on these buckle edges, pop that in the mouth and do various movements. And I'll show you the movements just in a minute. I put coxide, eugenol, on the fitting surface of the tray, goes into the mouth. Here it is in Bert's mouth. So I push that up. And notice Claire's got these little retractors, just keeping the lips out of the way. She takes that away. And then I make sure I firmly push that up onto the ridge. Get it nicely seated. Hold it in place, totally relax and mold the cheeks. So I'm border molding the buckle edges of the, of the cheeks. And then I get into really waggle his jaw. Waggle your jaw. That's the coronoid process, moulding the back of the denture, and then open wide, and then finally suck my finger. Suck. So it actually contracts the modiolus here. So I'm really trying to get him to perform functional movements he would do in his everyday life. So the denture is not going to dislodge during his everyday life and social functions. So. So that's that, take that out. So it's, it's beautifully molded at the back here. And then I trim it just with a blade, just to neaten that up, a scalpel, cut that away, goes back to the mouth. And then this is the secret in terms of recording that uh, front bit, the flabby bit here. So I have a really fine tip. This is a very light bodied impression material. It's just like you'd use for crown and bridge uh, impressions. So, and I squirt it with a fine tip right round the junction between the, the border between the tray and the, um, the ridge there. And then I have a second um, gun loaded without the fine tip on this time and just squirt that into, you can see how loose and flabby that tissue is. And just this light bodied silicone, squirt it around and just cover it up completely, just trying to rub it in so it just gets into all the little nooks and crannies of that um, uh, soft tissue. And then there's the impression. And you can actually see right in the middle of that yellow bit where the, that flabby bit of tissue just sits really nicely. So, and actually if you look at the, prim this is my primary impression. This primary impression, primary cast was made using a compound impression so it's really solid. So it's actually squidged that um, flabby ridge at the front there. If I superimpose the definitive cast here, you can see how that, it all sort of relaxes, doesn't it, there. So that's the definitive uh, cast. And then we can make the, uh, the actual denture fit over that. And Rowan really carefully replicates the shape of the definitive impression in the final denture. You know, really skillfully does that. It's beautiful. So. How do we get this really solid lower? So, and I'll show you the technique I used for that. So th this was, first of all, primary cast, really overextended primary impression done in alginate. So I've captured right up the retromolar pads, all of the buccal shelves, all the way round, all that lingual surface. So I've got a really big cast and then I can make the special tray. And we made it in two parts, two part special tray. So the first bit is for the saddle area. So, and that just fits over the, these, the distal extensions where there are no teeth there. And then another bit fits over the top like that. That's the second bit, front bit that fits over. So it all goes together. Don't be confused about the two differences in colour, it's irrelevant. Rowan just used two different acrylics, it doesn't matter, they could be the same colour. So, so that all goes together. So what essentially it means is I can do the first bit of the impression with this back tray here without the front teeth getting in the way of my impression. So I do my border moulding with the green stick. Border moulding with green stick put some zinc oxide in this here, and then I take this to the mouth. So here it is in the mouth. Claire's got a little retractors in, just holding the lip away. This is a video, so she just takes those away. Okay, just close it up a little bit. 
I measure, I seat it, and I do these movements. E, lick the lip. Push against the lower front teeth with the tongue and swallow. So it's five movements, and this is what I do for all complete dentures, those five movements, and they're dead important. So it's holding the tray in place, it's E, O, lick the lip, push against the lower front teeth with the tongue, and then have a really good powerful swallow. And if you notice, Claire squirted a bit of water in the mouth just before the patient did the uh, swallow. She's got the three in one tip, just squirt the water in, get the patient to close, I hold the tray, a powerful swallow, and it border moulds it functionally all the way around. So I'm talking about complete dentures tomorrow in detail, so we'll really explore the design of the special tray tomorrow if you want to come along to that. So over the top of this, so we've got that impression done, wait for it to set, and then in that tray over the top here I use alginate, it just goes over it, and then that takes a nice impression of the lower front teeth, and then I take the whole thing out together, so it comes out really nicely, all in one, just like this, and then Rowan really beautifully goes from here to here, you know, with that, just copying those, that beautifully border moulded design. And because I'm really carefully border moulding, it's very rare that I have to adjust the flanges that fit. In fact, it's on, I just haven't had to do it for years because I make sure that the special tray is short of the width and depth of the sulcus and it's all border moulded beautifully by the impression material. So, next, centre relation. This is like absolutely key to find, to actually a stable denture. I want the patient, when they open and close together, like this, with full dentures, this is Julie with the full dentures in, I want them to just bite nice and evenly together when the patient just opens and closes. So that should, they, when the patient's um, socialising, talking, whatever, they feel the dentures have moved a little bit, they can just bite them back into place evenly and recreate that suction and stability. So finding centric is dead important. So if I have the patient here, so we pretend that's a patient, superimpose the articulator, I really want the articulator to just represent the patient. I just want it to do what the patient's doing, a simulator. If we remove all of the natural teeth, our ICP, our intercuspal position, that normal position that we all bite into, disappears. So the only stable reference that I have is centric relation. Now, I just do not use wax rims at all for recording centric relation now. I've had too many occlusal errors with normal wax rim registration. So this is what I use now, which is a central bearing apparatus. It's brilliant, I love it. And it's, it's actually consists of a plate on the lower and the upper, and there's just one pin. We have a plate at the top, a pin on the lower, they touch together. I'll show you how this works in reality. So here we've got the definitive models. And on those we've got light cure bases, they're really solid bases, and then waxed onto those solid bases, I've got two plates. There's a flat plate on the upper, and on this low we've got a, a pin which I can screw up and down to alter the vertical dimension. They go in the mouth like this. They're absolutely superb. So that point here, and I'll just use my laser pointer now, there, that's the only point of contact between the upper and lower jaw, that pin. And then I get the patient to move around, go forward and back side to side on that pin. But before I do that, I make, I put a pencil mark on here on the upper plate. This is a China graph pencil. So I warm up the plate, put this on so it's a lovely black surface and the patient can then bite together and scribe out a triangle on here, an arrow. And I'll show you how it works in the mouth. 
So this is it here in place. And then we've got Nancy here. She's going to demonstrate this whole process. So she's going to go forwards, forwards, forwards and back, back forwards, forwards, back, forwards, back, forwards, back, forwards, forwards, back, forwards, back, forwards, back, and then side to side. All over. Go for it, Nancy. Really grind. Try and make a circle on it. Draw it out. So, and so the, it's forward and back, forward and back, and it's the back bit that is center of relation. That's the most important part. So I want them to really deprogram themselves and then go forwards and back, forwards and back, side to side. And this is what they produce. It's amazing. It really is. Um, we have a triangle and the point of the triangle here, that is centric relation. And that's where I want to position the upper and lower models. And the way that I do that is I put a plate on this, like that, it's got a little countersink hole right over the apex of the triangle. Tighten it up so it's nice and secure. Goes back into the mouth like this. And then I've got to guide Nancy back into the hole so she's actually gone into that countersink hole with the, and then I use a bite registration material to squirt between. So, and this is, this is Futar D bite registration material. It's a German product, cat and back. Futar D is brilliant for bite registration. So it's nice and solid. It comes out like this. So it's all like super secure. We found it. So, and this is what Rowan does. So, from that, we've already done our wax rim. Remember, we've done that for Julie. We've carved it out. I do a face bow on that in the mouth, and then that face bow goes onto the articulator here, and then that upper model gets mounted, and then the Gothic arch system, that central bearing apparatus which I use, just fits onto the lower, and then Rowan then plaster cast the lower model and then we've got Julie's head on the bench or Nancy's head on the bench ready to set the teeth up in center relation so that is really really terrific love that system so next number six now you know it's really annoying isn't it when you you know in the past I've fitted dentures and it still happens occasionally but a fitted dentures and um, you think everything's good, the patient's verified the try-in, they go away and they come back and they don't like the look of them and then it's a remake and it's costly doing that. So doing these try-in videos has really, it's, it's actually helped reduce this. I've had two remakes in the past six years for complete dentures since I've been using this system and all I do is make dentures, I don't do anything else other than dentures. Uh, so, I want to share with you that secret. So here's Nancy, not Nancy, this is Emmy, sorry. And Emmy, uh, it was great, she brought this photo in, this is her with the natural teeth here. She wanted to replicate this arrangement. She had like a, a proper Nanny McPhee type um, incisal position and she wanted to reproduce it and it was great. So this is Nancy here at the try-in. She's got a wax, full wax try-in at the top. And this is a video of her just chatting and um, we just this is what we do at the try and video ignore her lower teeth I fixed those later she had a fixed lower bridge which we remade but this was specific to look at that upper there full upper try in and what we do is I don't do this Claire does it for me and uh, the patient just sits down and Claire sits over there, we have a tripod and a video, and then we set that running, and then Claire just asks the patient, engages with them, you know, where are you going on holiday, what books are you reading at the moment, and just has a proper chat with the patient, and then they can actually then sit down and look at themselves in a proper social situation, rather than getting a mirror, you know, you know what happens when you give a patient a mirror, they pull these funny faces, don't they, and, and it, and actually engages a different part of the brain, actually, then it's an analytical part of the brain, not this, what they are, truly, how they look. But, and it's really important to get a nice smile as well. Claire gets, the patient is really relaxed coming to the practice and it's really important they can just do that. And then they, 
I, we, they, we sit them down with Claire. So we've got the video running on the big screen. On the small screen, we've got like still photographs and quite often it'll be still photos of them with their trying in place or photos of their previous dentition that they want to copy. And in addition, we give them the mirror too. So they've got three things to look at at this point. I go out of the room, but before I go out of the room, I say to the patient, look, it's really important. I want you to be dead honest with me about this at this point in time because we can still make changes. So please be picky about it. And then I go out of the room, go to the lab, and Claire just has a conversation. And then she comes through to the lab and goes, after having a chat with them, yeah, it's usually this, or sometimes it's that. You know, sometimes we're gonna make changes, so that's what we do at this point. And it's just like, doing this is massively important. If, I'm sure loads of you here do implant work and it, probably a lot of fixed work, and it is, I think it's massive, I think it's a really useful tool for that, because this is what I did for Emmy, this particular patient. We actually gave her an upper bar and a sleeve denture. She'd had, she had, I think, three different implant systems in the maxilla there. She, she's got a noble biocare, uh, uh, Ankylos and TBR, these French implant systems. She had three different, she came to see me, all, and they're all at different angles, they're all over the place. So we put a bar on it and then a sleeve over the top. And we we're really lucky because the Nanny McPhee tooth had that you know, the upper right one, we had that screw access hole right over it, so we were actually able to bring it forward. But, um, you know, planning this sort of work, it's really expensive, isn't it? You know, this is like a massively expensive piece of kit. And with sleeve over dentures, I make two for a patient if we're doing this treatment. We make two sleeves to fit over the bar because they can chew like mad on these things and they break and wear them so they have two and what I do is so what Emmy does is she's got Monday denture Tuesday denture you know she swaps them alternate days so they both wear at the same rate they both we both know they fit but when one catastrophically breaks then she can actually bring it in to Rowan into the lab and get it repaired quickly so just a little aside for that. So this is her final restoration here. So, and she wanted it, she said, yeah, I want it characterized. Her word was distressed, you know, like distressed furniture to make it like a piece of furniture look old. She wanted her teeth to look like that so they look natural for her. And this is what I really, really love doing, like a little bit of an onlay on that uh, premolar, cracks, stains, etc. So, and if I didn't have these photos to work from, there's no way I'd be producing this sort of work either. They're really a vitally important part of the whole process. So, right, next. My final point is patient communication, really. And it's really important the patients understand the limitations of removable dentures. Even though they fit, I can make them fit really well they're still removable and they're still not glued into anything. They're just sitting on the gums if they're full, full dentures. So we've got here, um, I've forgotten his name, but he's, I'm, and this is, and I'm gonna show you the consult, what I talk to every patient about when I'm, before I actually make dentures. So this is my first appointment with this chap here. And, he, he doesn't look compass mentis, but he is. And what I so show them is I show them this video here. And then can you see how this this video of an x-ray video of someone eating with complete dentures. And that face, video shows how the teeth move around during function when a person is e eating. The, the and essentially so, what I'm trying to say to the patient is... I'm just been wearing these it. for years. You can see them very worn. You know, but, um, what I'm trying to say with that show, with that video, is yeah. that with removable dentures that are not held in by anything, no. we are reliant heavily on your control of the dentures themselves yeah. by your, the way that your cheeks and your tongue. Yeah hold them together and down. 
and it's a it's a learned thing like um, using a knife and fork yeah. you know if we said right Frank it's chopsticks yeah. that you have to use from now on yeah. you, you know it would take you quite a long time to learn how to yeah. use them yeah. very well and it's exactly the same with dentures so what I'm saying is that it's I the, the patient has a responsibility as well to make these things work and um, you know it's and the other analogy that I use is it's a bit like learning to drive a car you know when we first learn to drive we've got to really think about it and use our you know part of our conscious mind to actually do it and then a few years down the line you can actually you don't even think about driving you can have a phone conversation and do think about so many other things and I think it's just the same with with dentures too and I think it's really important this bit um, but what I'm trying to say here what I'm trying to say to the patient is um, you know it's all about neuromuscular control you know and that's what I'm trying to teach them because it is a really vitally important bit I really wish my patients had this level of yeah. no, <laughs> so we <laughs> We, we wouldn't need to have this lecture or today if, if all our patients were able to do that. So, but what I'm trying to do really is, seriously, I want to under-promise and over-deliver. That is key. It doesn't matter if the dentures fit beautifully. If I've over-promised, it it's really totally irrelevant. So, right. Last case, this is, this is a case just to summarise and just bring everything together that we've been talking about. So this is Christina. Christina's got this upper bridge that's hanging off. It's held in with poly grip. You know, she just glues it in. She's got that one tooth, I think. This upper premolar is, is okay, but the rest are, are really shot in the maxilla. These lower teeth are in beautiful condition. She's got immaculate oral hygiene. It's lovely. So. Let's have a look at her here, Christina. And then when she opens, this bridge drops down. She's actually posturing just to keep it in place. This is what she wanted. And this is what I always want from my patients. I want a wish list. And she wanted her beautiful smile back. That's her with a natural dentition. Now, actually, Christina lived in Boston in Massachusetts. And she'd been to see 10 different prosthodontists in Boston and New York, and all of them had pushed implants for her, and she didn't want to have dental implants. She wanted a denture, and she wanted a denture because she had, she takes bisphosphonates, and also she had a mitral valve replacement, and she also needed AB cover, or wanted AB cover for that. Her cardiac surgeon recommended that. So she basically just didn't want dentures, and that's what she wanted. So she went on the internet and found this video that had been produced by John Besford. And she loved the video, the way that John produced these really beautifully characterized dentures. And it really spoke to her. And this particular part here really spoke to her. So here we have um, Stephanie That's with lovely. her full denture fitted. You've got me back. You've <laughs> got me back. <laughs> so, and that really spoke to Christina and so she actually emailed John Besford and John said, look, I've retired. Why don't you come and see Finn in England? And um, so we set up a dialogue together with Christina. So this is what she wanted. I got the radiographs and then I could then use that to come up with a provisional plan. So, and we actually communicated on the phone as well. And then I produced my treatment plan letter. This is like a standard letter I do for all of my patients, just because we are, it's really, you know, consent is so important um, with these sorts of things. And this is what we decided to do. An immediate upper overdent should just retain that four, but make, just cut it down. RCT overdenture, so full upper essentially, full upper and a lower partial metal based denture. And we actually got her to come over for three weeks and we do the treatment in around about eight days, seven days, but then we have a little bit of problem time if we needed it. So we arranged for her to come over. So, so she came over to, um, to Lancaster, to, to Garstang in England. And here she was, it was a bit nerve-wracking actually. It's the first American I've ever treated like this. It was like, 
I was nervous. So day one, she was lovely, Christina. So here we are, day one. And you can see that she's biting together and the bridge is loose. So let's get these upper teeth out. We've got that root canal treated. So definitive impression for the upper and really nice definitive impression for the lower. I'll be talking about partials on the last day of the Congress. And, but really, I want to have my distal extensions just like a complete denture for partials. So here we are, day one. Right at the end of day one, we did a wax rim using her photos. And then we you know, used that photo to replicate this smile. So by the end of day two, we had acrylic upper and acrylic lower made for her. So we made the, the upper acrylic and then lower acrylic base just to keep it stable. And then we got on making the chrome. So here's the chrome. It's just like a resin bonded, like a removable resin bonded bridge, fits on the back edge. And that's it fitted. And so by day seven, we've got the full upper and lower fitted. And it was really lovely because Christina also wanted a little bit of characterization on her upper teeth, you know, a little bit yellowing, a little bit stainy, a bit of wear, just to try and mimic those lovely lower incisors she's got. We've got gold clasps on here. I love gold on anterior teeth. So and that's it at day seven. And then day eight, John Besford, who was on holiday in Scotland, and he was travelling down through Lancashire, and at that time when Christina was here, so we went out for a meal on day eight. It's the first time I've ever sat eating, you know, having a meal with a patient that I've fitted dentures for, plus my mentor there, you know, straight after the dentures were fitted. But fortunately, it was fine. She ate goose and a duck, beautifully. So, and then day nine, we just, I was reviewed her and we just had a chat and I just showed her some of the photos from the, uh, having the meal before. And um, it's all, it was all about John. It's all about him. It's not you, Finn. It's about, <laughs> it's all about him. Oh my God. It was, she's a character. It was lovely. So, and then this, this is why I do, love what I do, actually. This is why I do what I do, because it really makes a difference to these people. It's only plastic teeth, I know that, but it really makes a difference to the patients. So, and, it's, um, and I love it. So, um, and it's just really great being here in Australia. I love it. Adelaide's just gorgeous, the place. And I've come over with the family and have had such a good time. So, and thank you for listening very much. So, I, I'm Thank you, Dr. Sutton, for today's presentation on the seven pillars of denture wisdom. So, are there any questions at all? I think we've got a cube. So, we've got, we, there's a microphone on this, like, cube here, which uh, Tracy has. Sorry. Um, the neuromuscular, you know, adaption. Yeah, yeah. Do you find it the older they get, the harder that is? Absolutely. It's a really, uh, definitely, and it's really, you know, because I'm, we're treating more elderly patients and giving them complete dentures now. Because like in the past, it was like in their forties, and now they're like eighty or ninety. It's just like their adaptive capability just drops off uh, hugely. So. <laughs> That conversation is like majorly important. And also Alzheimer's too is a big deal for cognitive behavior. You know, I think cognitive abilities to actually keep them in place. So yeah, go for it. Um, and also I've seen, um, you know, the guy from Clinical Associates, I can't remember his name. At the moment. Yeah, yeah. And he talks about his full denture cases. He d does not touch the fitting surfaces at all. There's no pumicing or polishing. Yeah, yeah. Everything is exactly as he takes his impressions. You do, looks like you do the same thing. Absolutely. We, keep, we preserve that fitting surface so it just fits intimately on the plaster. 
you know, so I don't touch it at all. So it's actually, it's a little bit rough actually, just ever so slightly, almost like it's like been sandblasted. Um, occasionally though, if there are support issues, maybe there's a torus or something, I don't want it to dent. So if there's a, say, a maxillary torus, often it'll just rock on that torus. So we'll put relief over that, like a, a tin foil of about 0.5 of a millimeter, just to allow it to sink into the soft tissues around it. So, but most of the time it's adapted beautifully to that cast. A fantastic presentation. I just wanted a quick question about uh, tooth size and uh, shape and colour. Yeah, yeah. You, in creating your naturally beautiful smiles. Yeah, that's a really good question. If you come to my complete denture talk tomorrow, I'm going to talk about tooth size calculation. I've got a really great method for calculating that using the dentate picture, so the mould and shape of the teeth. Ben, thanks for a great presentation. I'm looking forward to the rest of the Congress hearing you. Um, you just mentioned you don't touch the fit surface, but do you manipulate the post dam area? Is there some kind of yeah. carving on the cast, or is that incorporated into the final impression with some compound? It's the first bit. So we cut in a really nice deep post dam on that posterior border. So, and it's, a, it's actually shaped like the Cupid's bow and it goes right around, it's really right around the tuberosities. So right around the tuberosities and about, about one millimetre depth in the side bits, you know like where there's connective tissue, but in the middle where it's quite often really hard on that hard palate, 0.5 of a millimetre depth. And it's a bit like a swimming pool. You know, you've got a deep bit at the back and then it's shallow, it goes shallow towards the front of the mouth, if you will. Thank you for a great presentation. I'm up here. <laughs> Sorry. Here. Here. Hello. Yes. Um, what do you think of bite planes for those gross class twos? Oh yes. Um, we don't incorporate them actually. Um, we just keep it, the occlusion just on the posterior teeth. So it's totally free. So it's almost like their natural teeth really. So I don't use a big chunky bite platform at all. Thank you. And, and they adapt beautifully to it as well, you know, even with a massive overjet. And I'll be showing a case tomorrow with a huge overjet where we just had occlusion on. She had an AOB and she just had occlusion on the sevens. It's quite interesting. You know, a combination syndrome case. So. Cool. Thank you.